Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Live From My Drum Room. I have a very special show today celebrating the 70th birthday of the great Jeff Beccaro, one of my absolute biggest heroes. And joining me on the show is my dear friend Robin Flans, who is the author of this new Jeff Beccaro book, Moments in Time, Jeff Beccaro Stories, available through Hudson Music. And in fact, it's on sale all this week on Hudson Music's website. And you might recall she also authored this book in 2020. It's about time. Jeff Picaro, The Man and His Music, another fabulous book by Robin and also available through Hudson Music. But a really special part of this is the legendary producer Gary Katz also joined us for this episode. This was kind of a last minute thing. I wasn't sure if Gary was going to be able to join us, so I didn't announce it ahead of time, you know, for the live show. But sure enough, Gary jumped on a few minutes into the episode, as you'll see. I'd never met him before. I was so honored to meet him and to have him on the show and have him share some stories about Jeff. As you probably know, Gary is the man that produced all those big Staley Dan records from the 70s into the early 80s, as well as some other records. He knew Jeff very well and shared some wonderful stories about the great Jeff Beccaro. So come along for the ride. Fasten your seatbelt, as we say. I really think you're going to love this. I also stuck in a, a bunch of my favorite Jeff Beccaro songs. So I hope you enjoy this. I, in fact, I know you're going to enjoy this. I'll see you on the other side. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. So please welcome, here with me now, my dear friend, Robin Flans. Hi. Robin. Hi, Robin. It's good to see you, John. And um, if I might say a couple of things right off the bat. Please, um, yes, yes. First, I, I want to send out my love, my heart, and my thoughts to the Picaro family today, um, all his loved ones. It's, I, I know, all of these days, I mean, every day, I'm sure, is hard for them. All the loss, I can't even imagine. And they have handled it with such grace and outpouring of warmth towards everyone. But today is a big one, as Jolene put it on Facebook, um, Jeff's 70th my God, he should still be here. Um, yeah. So uh, I send my love to them. And off topic a little bit, I want to say congratulations to you on your milestone oh. viewership. Um, you, you should be proud. You're doing such great things. And it's such a service to everyone in the music industry. And We've been good friends for so many years, and I adore you, and um, thank you for having me today. So Thank you so much, Robin. And, and the feeling is so mutual, you know that, and likewise, I have so much love and respect for you, and, and I will say that, you know, I, I'm taking a page out of your book, really, in terms of what you've been doing for drummers for as long as I can remember, before I knew you, before I'd ever met you, when I was reading all those beautiful interviews in Modern Drummer that you that you did. I mean, you were the one, you know, with all due respect to all the people that worked for Modern Drummer in those days, you got the best out of all these drummers. You, your ability to, especially Jeff, you could feel it. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I'm proud of my work with Modern Drummer um, because I feel that I did get some good interviews with some great people and I maintained great friendships with many of those people. I mean, I'm so honored to have worked for, uh, I don't know, close to 40 years for yeah. that magazine. And um, I loved every minute of it. That's yeah. And we did too. We all did too. Everybody that, read those articles and interviews did too. And um, I, I have to tell you, you know, we, we needless to say, we have many, many people watching today for this show. And thank you for, for making it um, so special for me because, uh, you know, I, I, I would have loved to have done something to talk about Jeff on his 70th, but having you here really just 
you know, makes it. Well, it's not about me. It's not, I haven't brought those people because of me. I have brought those people because of Jeffrey, just like I, I, everybody says, congratulations on the book. It's (laughs) if it weren't about Jeff, there'd be no people (laughs) buying it. So I have no false ideas. (laughs) Yes. Well, you've, but you've brought all these great stories to life. And I just have to say our f- dear friend, Jody Cortez is watching and Aww. I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to like lead off. I think I noted it in the book. There's a great, and needless to say, there's, I know Jody, I've, we've known Jody forever. I've known Jody as long as I've known you 35 years and I love him and I love you, Jody. Um, and over the years, whenever I'd see him, he'd, he'd always have a Jeff story. We'd, he'd always reminisce about how he grew up in the Procaro family and the great story that he tells in the book where it's in here somewhere where he's, <laughs> he went to see Jeff play and it was double drums with him and Jim Gordon. And they're standing. Oh, God, yeah. Do you remember that story? Jody, I hope I don't botch this. I, <laughs> I, uh, yeah. It's, I've got it right here. Jody Cortez, Jim Gordon story. And, uh, yeah, he's he, so I ran into the restroom standing at the urinal and in walked Jeff and Jim Gordon and they stand next to me. Jeffrey's to my right. Jim Gordon is to his right. And I go to Jeff. Jeff, you're the best drummer in the whole world, man. And he goes, no, he's the best drummer in the world. So our heads all turn to the right and look up at Jim Gordon. <laughs> I just I just yeah, I, it, it's <laughs> such an image. right? I mean, what an image the two of them. All three at the urinal. Yes, yes. And, and, and I would tell you, you know, I can tell you, speaking personally, men tend to have these conversations in urinals, you know, and really? there's a, there's, well, there's a, I, I'm, I'm going off topic slightly, but 10 years ago when Hal Blaine was honored at the NAM TE, TE uh, tech, whatever it is called, the award ceremony that NAM does, they honored Hal and Jim Keltner and Chad Smith were presenting the award to Hal. And somehow we all ended up in the men's room together. And Don <laughs> Randy, before it started, we all we all decided we should visit the men's room before the festivity. So it's just and I, I and then as we came out, someone took a picture of all of us as we all stepped out of the men's room, like standing there, you know, and uh, it, it was priceless. I, just, I remember thinking like we're all in the bathroom. I don't know. It's this is great. Maybe yeah, maybe. no, it's great. It's great. <laughs> it's perfect. I mean, not the same with women. Uh, so it's yeah. very funny. It is. It's, it's there's nothing dirty about it. I'm just saying it's just a, no. It's a funny, funny. It's a funny humorous. Thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And and I saw that Stanley Sheldon, our friend Stanley Sheldon, is also uh, watching. And Stanley, of course, is in the Hi, book. Hi guys. Yeah. So, um, so Robin, let me let me just jump in here and say so. Everybody, and me especially, love this book that you wrote four years ago. It's about time, and. I think you said something at the time that um, you weren't quite finished, but I think at the same time, you maybe weren't excited to, you need, maybe needed to take a break. You weren't ready to. No, take I thought I was finished. You did. Okay. No, I, I really thought that was it or I would have written more, but, and it's happening again, John. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, <laughs> Since this book came out, I'm, and there are no plans, trust me, but I'm so frustrated because people are messaging me and saying, oh, I was this and that for Toto. I did this, I did that, and Jeff was this and that, and here's my story. Mm-hmm. And I'm so frustrated. Why didn't I know this? Why, after the first book, didn't they message me and tell me this story so I could have included it in this book? And now I have a new collection. (laughs) It's, I'm pulling my hair out, seriously. I know, I I understand, I understand. This book, I mean, I ended up with a whole chapter on Jeff with double drums because I hadn't realized. And what I've told people is, and and maybe they didn't read the post, but what you don't understand is that when Jeff was here, there was no internet. 
anything yeah. that I knew about Jeff and his work had to come from either a silly little press release from the record company, which was not detailed. It was probably about the current project that Toto was working on, or it had to come from Jeff's mouth. And yeah. Jeff didn't talk that much about the details of his yeah. work. He yeah. certainly didn't boast about it. He certainly didn't, if it was a project related interview, say about Toto 4, that's what he talked about. So I never knew the details of his playing world. I didn't know to ask him about his double drumming. Yeah. And then came the internet and shit. <laughs> all this wealth of information opened up to me and i'm so angry well, at him for I, not having shared all of this stuff with me well maybe maybe first of all i i want to tell you that our our surprise guest is in the waiting room <gasps> so oh! I uh, shall i shall I, i'm, gonna, I'm gonna, double drums because Okay, I'm going to let he you introduce him. something to do with that right off the bat on one of the albums this giant produced on Jeffrey. He is a legend. He produced Steely Dan and many albums that had Jeffrey on it, he became, I want to say his, Jeffrey became his favorite drummer, but I don't want to take words and put them in this man's mouth, but he became, and I said it in my thank yous in this current book, the greatest gift Jeffrey left me. And he's none other than the legendary Gary Katz. He honored me with the foreword to this current book. It's and beautiful. trust me, it wasn't easy to get him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but not because he didn't want to, but because he was overwhelmed by the task. But yeah. he yeah. pulled it off and it's a beautiful thing. It is Just, beautiful. So, so, oh! And there he is. Hello, guys. Gary Katz, what an honor, man. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, that's okay. Robin's an old friend, and Jeffrey's an even older friend. Wow. Gary, we're not really old friends. We're just really new soulmates. Call it what you will. I've known Robin for quite a while, and Jeffrey as well. Wow. Well, I, you know, I mean, I, it's just, this is incredible. Thank you for being here. We were just saying the forward that you wrote in the book was just so beautiful. And uh, it, you, what I love about what you've written in this book, Gary, and, and not just the forward, but even throughout all the different times you're mentioned in here and the stories you tell, you really paint a picture. You, you bring him to life uh, is the best way I can describe it through how well you knew him and obviously how much you loved him. Um, can I can I ask when do you, when do you recall being the first time you met Jeff? Uh, Jeff and David came out to um, Cherokee Ranch because we were having a problem getting a track we liked for the song Night by Night, and uh, Denny Diaz, who was one of our guitar players, said, "Oh, I know a couple." Well, actually, he said, "I know a couple of guys." <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> Jeffrey and David came out one night around midnight and they played night by night. That was the first time I met Jeffrey. And, and that and that album, I was that's what I was talking about, has Jeff and Jim Gordon. Yes, Jim Gordon played that drums. record. Uh, Je Jim played most of the album. Mm -hmm. And he was uh I don't I don't know what to say about Jim. He was a a fabulous musician, and as far as I knew, a great guy. 
Obviously, yeah. there are other issues. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Yeah, and I, and yeah. I have a good friend, uh, Mike Ruggiello, who's a big fan of yours, and was wondering in your hint last week whether I was going to be on the show, but he's a big <laughs> fan. <laughs> yes, and Mike is watching, and he says hello to you. I'm sure um, he is. Hi, Mike. Yeah. He's a great guy. He's an old friend from, gosh, we've known each other since we were kids. Yeah, you know him longer than I do, but we've gotten to know each other. I like him a lot. He's a great guy. And also, your friend Rob Wallace is is watching and says hello. Oh, cool. And he's making a reference to the Yankees, which being a Red Sox fan. Well, I'm you not can gonna... tell him he can take his Yankees, turn the sound down a little, bend over, <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy his day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's how it goes. Okay, I get it. Well, uh, so, so Gary, so you met you met Jeff and David Page during that session. How? Yeah, how... they came out and helped us get that track we needed, and you know they were just so great. There was nothing to say. Yeah, uh, Gary, what was your first impression of Jeff's playing? Why did you fall in love with him? I don't know, honestly. I I I couldn't tell you that it just happened. And, um, you know, we, I work, I had, I was very fortunate to be able to work with most of the great drummers in America over the years, you know, Jim and Purdy and Keltner and <clears throat> uh, Jeffrey and I just became friends. So I loved working with Jeffrey. We, we, um, for one thing, Jeffrey's greatest gift is he knew how to make a record. Not just that he could play, mm. but he could hear the record as he was playing the drums and there was hardly any other music. It's a gift. And the great drummers know how to play knowing they're making a record. Yeah. Can you Jeffrey, elaborate? What does that Jeffrey mean? He's great at that. What does that mean? It means he he heard the song, but let's say it's Donald for a minute. Donald would, you know, scratch a vocal while, while the guys were playing. And Jeffrey knew where to put the fills and where to just play a groove. And so that at the end of the day, he heard that record before it was made. Mm. As great drummers do. But he just had a really great knack. And he and I, you know, we just connected in the studio. Mm. You know, Gary, it's interesting you say that because that's a kind of a, a consistent theme in the book that yourself and other people, you know, Lee Rittenauer, there's a bunch of, you know, other legendary musicians that are quoted in Robin's book that say essentially the same thing you're saying, that he had that, that ability to, I guess, kind of almost be like a producer in a sense, right, where he kind of had an overall idea of, how the well, song you know, David, David and Jeffrey had the benefit of having fathers who were great musicians. Yeah. And as we were growing up, you know, you learned, if no other way, even by osmosis. But with Jeffrey, Joe was not by osmosis. Joe showed Jeffrey yeah. what the story yeah. was. So the, the first Steely Dan record that Jeff did for you was... Pretzel Logic. Pretzel Logic. Okay. Yeah. He played night by night. Yeah. And was that 74? Yeah, you know, you're asking the wrong person. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I <laughs> no I, I'm I'm always intrigued at just how the, the the amount of work he was already doing by the time he was like twenty, you know. It's, when we it's... went to Europe and I took Jeffrey, Joe and Aileen had to sign a permission slip because he wasn't eighteen. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, and they so should have, right? Because he was um he was quite a little mischief maker. He right? was a hot shot in the valley. He was a valley boy. <laughs> <laughs> there was, was he, a... and Dave, he and David and Lukather and Landau and all these guys, young you know, guys who grew up in the valley, who great musicians and they, you know. They interchange with each other. You could have used Landau and not Luke, or you could have used Luke and not Lee. I mean, it just was a 
collection of great musicians at the time. But I'm talking about on a personal level. There's that story in the first book about the first night in the hotel. You were oh, in a that was good. hotel. Well, so when we went to London, my first time in London also, okay. we uh, we put, not I, but it was arranged. So the band stayed at one hotel. And Donald Walter and I and our sound guy, an oddball Scotsman called Dinky Dawson, who was fabulous. We stayed at another hotel, I guess you might say a better hotel. And we it was three in the morning and we were just sitting in a room, the four of us, you know, lamenting the, the trip we just took and thrilled to be in London for the first time. And there was a knock at the door at about, you know, literally 3.30. And Jeffrey was standing there with his bag saying, where are the bitches? <laughs> So we figured that was good enough and we let him stay at the hotel too. <laughs> he was he was wise beyond his years. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. There were a lot of adjectives he could have used. That might be one. <laughs> uh, but it, but it really was a case again it's it's you know and I I know this about him anyway even but it's 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 so often mentioned in Robin's book how um, you know, the level that he was, he, you know, so many people say that even when he, like you said, Gary, when he was 18, he was, he was a pro. I mean, he was a, a, a real pro, not pro from the standpoint of getting paid money, but he just knew shit that a lot of guys didn't figure out till they were in their twenties. Like I said, he and David had the benefit of having very successful parents in the business they wanted to be in. And it was a great asset for both of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, David's father was, you know, he was the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Marty, Marty. Page, Marty yeah. Page was the deal. And David's a fabulous, just, he's a great, great musician. Absolutely, man. And, and having worked with him as much as you did, Gary, I mean, his work ethic is, is pretty, Jeff's work ethic is pretty legendary, right? I mean, he, yeah, he came he prepared. Came to work. Yeah. He came to work and he wasn't going to leave till he, he knew it was what we wanted. He knew what we wanted when we weren't working and he had nothing to do. He would come to the studio and fall asleep on the couch, just listening. And he was always around. And, um, you know, we worked with good people and he took advantage of, of being around it. You know, he, 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 I won't say idolized, but he was very, <clears throat> appreciative of being able to be around Purdy and, and Jim and obviously, you know, Keltner and he were, Keltner took him under his wing when he was very young. And um, he just had a, the advantage of being around the good stuff much younger than other guys. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And you know, to your point, John, there's a story in the new book from a, a guy um, a composer and producer named Randy Edelman, who <laughs> who worked. Oh, you know him, Gary. Well, I have a good Randy Edelman story. <laughs> but he he worked on. Um, uh, he got a, a call to arrange um, Jim Neighbors on the Sonny and Cher show, yeah. and he didn't think that anyone would be able to do this, the drum part. And he was shocked to find out that this little putz, <laughs> this, seriously, this little putz, he went back to see who it was that executed his arrangement flawlessly. And it was a little putz, this little 17 year old person and he went up to him and he hugged him they were he couldn't believe that this guy had done this right from the start all the way through without a mistake jeffrey knew much more than he did <laughs> <laughs> so when when our contract was up with abc Clyde called me, Clyde called me, who I knew for a while. 
And he said, can I get a chance to talk to Donald and Walter? I said, sure. I called Donald. I said, so Clive called. He wants to talk. He said, hey, listen, let's take a trip home. And, you know, it's on his dime. And yeah, sure, no problem. So we did. And we walked in the office, you know, and I introduced Donald and Walter to Clive. And he's talking. He didn't talk for more than a minute. He said, wait a minute, I want to play you something. And he played some thing of Randy Edelman's he was working on. He was Randy, I think he was Randy Edelman's father. Because <clears throat> you couldn't have done more for a person than Clive tried to. <laughs> and uh, so that was fine. And then we talked for another three minutes. He said, wait, I got something. And he played another Randy Edelman track. <laughs> Wasn't particularly um, the music I liked or particularly cared for, nor anyone else in the room except Clive. And so he went on. He must have played us three, four tracks. Then he took us to lunch. When we came back from lunch, he said, you know, I'm not finished. I really want you to. And he played us another couple oh of Randy my tracks. Oh, God. And had nothing much more to say. He didn't make any offer. or Not that I expected it, but it was just, I like Clive. He's always been very nice to me. But it was a useless meeting except lunch and a trip home. And, uh, <laughs> as we were leaving, he gave us each a signed copy of his book. And when we went back to the hotel, Donald told me he took out the Bible from the hotel and he put the book in. <laughs> <laughs> but so whenever you... I hear Randy Edelman, I think of that. If oh that was God. Randy Edelman's solo album, I think that was Jeff on drums. It might have been. I have no idea. It's the only reference I have of Randy Edelman. Because it's not of that, or anything. I don't know him. Because of that Sonny and Cher thing, yeah. Randy hired him on his solo album. <laughs> and he did the right thing. He's not going to get anything much better, so I don't blame him. Maybe that's yeah. why Clive liked it. <laughs> that's a very yeah. funny... That is great, yeah. So we took our bu books and went home. That's so funny. <laughs> and Gary, I, I know I think I know the answer to this question, so excuse me if it's kind of a dumb question, but you know, you don't I don't hear a lot of, of people talking about how great a reader Jeff was. But obviously he could read because But that's his that's from his father. Yeah. Just like David. I mean they were brought up. Yeah. So all, apart from playing, gave lessons. Yeah. He was a very difficult yeah. teacher. I know people who were taught by him and left. Just he was very tough. Yeah. So you can only imagine how he was with Jeffrey. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeffrey knew how to read when he was seven. Seriously. Yeah. So did yeah. they did. That's why, you know, when they went around as a team, you know, it was hard to believe that these young punks could do what they did, but they were so far advanced to all these other guys because of, you know. Marty and Joe. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think it's Jeff always said he didn't he wasn't a reader, but you know Oh he... no, no. He read. Yeah. You, you couldn't do what he did. None yeah. of the... we just... only knew one guy in our circle who we still questioned whether he could read, but it it actually didn't matter to us. But Hugh McCracken, my really good oh. friend, may he yeah. rest in peace. We always questioned whether he could read. But Donald Walter would say, he plays jingles all day. He has to read. Mm. And so I would say, yeah, you know, I guess so. But when we would do dates, I could see Huey listening to Jeffrey or Purdy or whatever, or who was ever playing, and he would sit next to his amp in the room. The amp was barely audible, and he would, you know, nitpick a part. So we never knew whether he could read and to this day, but I can't imagine he couldn't. And Jeffrey was a reader when he, before he was 10. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I think it was just Jeff's humility, you know, like when he taught, he used to talk about how he couldn't play a shuffle. Yeah. Which is, uh, no, you know, that you know. humility was a bunch of bullshit. He knew exactly <laughs> what he could do. And my story about black, <laughs> you know, that, that was the shuffle story. Yeah, so that was just Jeffrey being, you know, get Purdy. He plays fucking shuffles, not me. 
And then he went in and he played Black Friday with his hand in a cast. Yeah. Right. Right. I know. Uh, uh, I know. And and I, I've heard the same thing, Robin. You know, I've, I've heard him say maybe during one of your interviews where he, he claimed he wasn't a very good reader. And I thought, you know, just as, as a not knowing him well, thinking like, well, man, how could he do what he does if he, he you know, playing with Steely Dan, you have to be able to read. Well, and, you didn't really have to be able to read. We didn't write charts except for Asia, which was a freak of nature the way it came out. Yeah. We didn't have charts. We had chord charts. So the guys didn't really have to read. <clears throat> and, you know, like I said, Jeffrey could read when he was a kid. Mm. But we, were, we didn't write charts. Rarely ever. Certainly not for the rhythm section. Okay. That's good you know, to know. Charting, Chuck would say to Walter, how do you want me to play this F sharp and whatever? But it wasn't a chart. It was just a matter of Chuck ch asking Walter what he really preferred. Paul Griffin never asked Donald a question. Purdy never asked anybody a question. And huh. even Jeffrey. You know, we loved these guys, not just because they were great, we didn't have to say anything. If we had to tell them, we had the wrong band. Mm. We weren't as good as these guys. Yeah. So yeah. we hired the guys who knew how to do it. Um, can you share a story, Gary? Any uh, uh, another Jeffrey story, a Steely Dan story? The, the Black Friday story is is legendary, obviously, with the his hand in a cast, but. Um, <laughs> I just, I, while I have you here, you're, you, you know. Honest. I know most of the stories, but I, I don't know, you know, as we talk story, you know, situations come to mind. I, I'm, I'm not a really good historical recounter as such, rather than responding to the conversation we're having. I got you. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, you can um, put me on the spot. I'm just, I'll sit here for too long trying to think of something. And some of the other artists that you produced, um, you hired Jeff, Jeffrey to play, play with as well. Yeah. Jeffrey, you know, I knew that night I'd leave with a track I liked every night. Yeah. I never had a day I didn't get a track that yeah. I used and liked. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm going to just flip through the book real quick here. Um, sorry, I didn't. There's to your point though. I was gonna. I was just gonna point out this a uh, Greg Bissonette story in the book that kind of uh, uh -huh. exemplifies what you were talking about, Gary. Which is, I, he had just learned the Rosanna beat, eight, 1982, and Greg's on a on a gig, I guess, and and Joe is there as well, and he says to Joe, "Hey, check this out," and he's playing the Rosanna beat, and 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 uh, I I knew Joe pretty well myself, you know, and and it's a, just like you said. He he kind of said to Greg. That's yeah, pretty good. It's pretty good, you know. Like <laughs> pretty close, I think. Pretty close. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure you've watched his Rosanna yeah. instructional instructional video. Yes, but that's what it was like. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't. He wasn't any different on that video than it was in the studio. Although he didn't talk, he just played. He, yeah. We we never gave. I never gave him any idea about what to play except that he always played in a position where he and I could look at each other and we did communicate during a take things I know he understood. Yeah. And he, and he worked pretty quickly in terms of number of takes. He could, he could get it, get what you needed. Well, silly Dan didn't. <laughs> of course, yeah, they're yes, they're it, it, Jeffrey. We, you know, the stories about you know doing a hundred takes or whatever. It's just not true, except for one track that Jeffrey Chuck and I did after Donald and Walter said, "Fuck this, this is not going to work," and I didn't want to. It was Gaucho and I. It was one of my favorite songs and still is. Yes. I said, no, no, no. We're not going to lose this song. And so they left in a, you know, sort of, you know, uh, um, sarcastically leaving and saying, we're going home. If you get the track, call me. Yeah. So Jeffrey and Chuck, who's my very close friend as well, 
the three of us stayed and we did, I had a chart. That was a, a, a night we had a chart. We made a chart and I would, he would play. Chuck was there so he could play for Jeffrey and he, Jeffrey would play. And when I heard good bars, I would mark them on the chart until like three, four in the morning. And then Roger Nichols, who was unprecedented as an editor. We did about 58 edits of the takes through the night. And then and I called Donald. I said, all right, come back. And they unbelievably said, yeah, it's great. And they left. <clears throat> it's so a great I, story. It's, yeah, it's a really good story. It's my absolutely the best work I've ever done was that night with Jeffrey and Chuck. Wow. Bravo, Gary. Yeah, that's yeah, no, uh, that was good. I that was a good night. And Chuck was that's what made you know to me and you know our relationship so special. He wasn't gonna leave till we had that track either. But Gary, you did a lot of other work with Jeffrey, not oh, just yeah. Dan. Yeah. Uh, and you picked him to do it. Pardon me? And you picked him to do it. Most of the time. There were, you know, I worked with, with Jim mm -hmm. and I worked with Purdy a lot. Painful as it is sometimes. <laughs> but I do work with, I mean, I've done lots of tracks with Purdy and he's a very good friend. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say Purdy and Jeffrey did most of the tracks I did. You know, Jim played occasionally. Rick Murata? Every, and every time Jim played or Murata, I would yeah. say, why don't they play more for us? Um, especially Jim, whose work I'm just in awe of every time. And yeah. uh, he played the best fill we ever we had on a Steely album. And I'm going to say this, and if Jim hears this, don't take offense. I mean it with a with a smile. But I always felt that the track would go, and every once in a while. Jim might not remember exactly where in the track we were. Please forgive me, Jim. I don't mean this. But when we were doing Josie, we got to the end of the solo. And I have always thought that he didn't remember that we needed a fill there to go back to the chorus. So he started it late and had to finish it quickly to get to the downbeat and he's a genius so you thought it was an accident oh no nothing <laughs> some of those guys played were accidents <laughs> you, can't, you can't play like that accidentally he just remembered he needed a fill and he had to rush it and the rushing made it fabulous it's our, is, our best fill on any record is it that fill where he does that little stuttery yeah yeah, and then finishes it. It's unbelievable. It's it's great it's, to play with musicians that are that great. That's yeah. all. And Jeffrey being right there with all of them. Yeah. yeah. But the other projects you worked with, the non-Steely projects that you worked with Jeff on, what were some of the ones? I think you're, you're going to have to tell me. Honestly, okay. I, I, I don't remember. Um, like Rosie... My friend Jim Br Jimmy Braylauer did it, all machines. We didn't have a live thing on that. And I'm just trying to think. Jeffrey played Joe Cocker that I did. Oh. Uh, what was how was what was that like? <laughs> I love Joe. He was just one of the most wonderful guys you'll ever meet despite the reputation and what it appears. He was so sweet. Mm. He was just a sweetheart. So we recorded at the village where I did a lot of my work. <clears throat> and um, Jeffrey was playing and I think Chuck was playing, whatever. And, and Joe doesn't write songs. So you always had to write the lyrics out for Joe. And he would sing it as if there were no lyrics there. He was just, he was one of the two best singers I ever worked with, he and Laura Nero. But Joe would have to read the lyrics. 
I don't know. We were doing it for a little bit. And then Joe said, hey, can we take a few minutes? I just want to see my friends. And I said, yeah, sure. So Robbie Robertson had an office in the building and he was a, we were all good friends. And Gary Busey was a friend of Joe's and that was always going to be trouble. <laughs> so he took a few minutes and when he came back to, you know, work, he said, anybody see my lyrics? So, of course, now I have the second running around the, the Studio D in the village looking for lyrics. It took a half hour and the second found it under the ice tray in the freezer. <laughs> you can only imagine how it got there. Uh, oh. Oh. And that was the session Jeff was on? Jeff, we played that, all those tracks with me and Joe. I, I just can't remember all the records. Jeffrey played a lot. He, Jeffrey played more tracks with me than anyone else. Purdy played tracks, but I'm trying to think. I, I don't know if Purdy played tracks for me other than with Donald. Um, Jeffrey played lots of stuff. He was, um, did you, did you, I'm sure you saw the, the fun side of Jeff too. I know he was, he was a, You've you've alluded to that, yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe you could share a funny anecdote of him. <laughs> why not yeah. his fun side. No. Well, for one thing, he was considerably younger than me, so I wasn't in and around that crowd, indulging in the fun side with them. And um, you know, it was uh, L.A. in the seventies. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, that should say enough. <laughs> There's... for a fact that the night Although I will tell you Jeff we worked so much mm. he wasn't quite the guy who said I better take this gig it might be my last as a lot of musicians are mm. he just was a professional he had gigs he wanted to play and he liked you know he liked playing on records that people were going to hear he called me one night, uh, you know, around 12 or 1. He knows I'm up really late. And he said, hey, I cut a number one record tonight. And he knew when he was cutting hits. And he called me and said, you know, I, I'm sure I cut a number one record tonight. And it was with Lionel, you know, dancing on the walls or ceiling, whatever that song. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And I remember he said, I, you know, I, I did this thing with Lionel tonight. I'm sure it's going to be number one. So, you know, these guys just played. Yeah. It's not yeah. like they were hanging out a lot. And they had fun while they were playing. In uh -huh. the yeah. yeah. Did he ever talk to you about the Ricky Lee Jones thing? No, I fixed the Ricky Lee Jones thing with Lenny for him. What do you mean? Well, Jeff, we got that gig. Lenny Warnicka and I are very close friends. Actually, I'm six hours older than Lenny, but we we became very good friends and still are. And when I, Lenny and I, basically signed Ricky Lee, I would go to the office every day <clears throat> before I'd go to the studio just to hang out. And in the morning at like eleven o'clock, only Lenny and I were there. You know, Titleman was at his studio and Templeman at his, and so forth. But Lenny and I would come to the office and just shoot the ship for an hour. And he said, hey, come listen to this. And he played me, you know, Chucky. And I said, oh, that's a really good song. And then he played me Last Chance Texaco, which I mean, I don't know if you can see, but I bought a lithograph of the last Texaco Ooh. station on Route 66. Uh -huh. Beautiful. And we signed her that day. So I, I became a little bit of the Ricky Lee world. Okay. Then she came to New York to do Saturday Night Live, and Lenny hates to travel. Okay. So he called me, said, would you go to the show? They were my friends anyhow. Would you go to the show and mix her thing? I did it for her and Randy when he would come. And so through all of that, they knew Jeffrey was my favorite drummer and I loved the Steely Records. So Lenny, who had not worked with Jeff, he had, he worked a lot with Jim. Yeah, yeah. 
And so they hired Jeffrey to do these dates. So they're recording and Ricky Lee's doing a stretch and Jeffrey's playing. And every time they get to this one spot, Ricky was a mess having fun. And she would yell in the phone, you know, in the mic, well, I know the story. Jeffrey, there's a fill. And, you know, okay, it happened once and Jeffrey would play a fill and whatever. They did another take and the same thing would happen. They did another take and the same thing would happen until Jeffrey, who was never best, would say, hey, Ricky, you don't have to tell me anymore. I know where the fill is. Next take, same thing. Jeffrey would have taken, he took the sticks, put them through the snare and left the building. Yep. And so she called Lenny and said, I want you to report Jeffrey to the studio. He walked out and I had all these musicians there. I want you to report him to the union. So Lenny called me, talked to Jeffrey. And I told Lenny, Lenny and I both agreed. If one person reports Jeffrey to the union, she'll never see a musician in LA again. She needs to know, you can be angry, you can call Jeffrey if you want. If you report him, you've done your last date in L.A. with musicians. And so Lenny and I sat and talked to her for an hour, and she didn't do it. Wow. But, really? Yes. What did you say to her? You can't do that. Exactly what we, Lenny, told her exactly what I just said to you. No and one will play. You can't do that because he... No one will play for you in L.A. if you report Jeffrey. He's popular. Because the solidarity. He's a popular guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, I never heard that part of the story. The next book, Robin. There's a story for the next book right there. Thanks yes. to Gary Katz. Wow. That'd be true. Wow. Yeah. You know, the whole Ricky, thing. Lenny had a, and I, and I, I have I like Ricky. I mean, I don't first of all, I, I'm a big fan. She's a fabulous well, artist. He was a mess in those days. But yeah. she's a fabulous artist. And yes. he knew what she wanted. And that just was going to be the wrong thing for her to do in L.A. So Lenny talked to her about that. And and Gary, wow. they worked together again after that, right? Didn't I remember reading Jeff, yes, Jeff with, with you, Robin? I mean, all of yeah. this came from Jeff's mouth. I have the story in the first yeah. book. Exactly. And, he, yeah. and, and then the... The end of the story that I have, of course, is Jeff telling me that a couple of years later or a few years later, when she made her next album, she was straight. Yeah. And, and, and he didn't got remember, a call right? to play the, al to play the album. And she didn't have any recollection of what had happened. And Probably he Jeffrey, in, too. He walks in yeah. and she says, oh, Jeff, it's so great to see you. Oh, you look like you lost weight. Yeah. And for a minute, he thought she was messing with him because he had actually gained weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the story ends. But the, he played and it went great. And that's what I have. Yeah. yeah. Boy. Life and show business. Yeah. yeah. Music world, L.A. 70s. Yeah. Different kind of time. Man. Wow. I never knew the part. I'm glad I asked that question. No, Lenny, I mean, Lenny and I talked a lot and, you know, I spoke, you know, Je I spoke with Jeffrey and whatever, and Lenny just said, you know, you can't do that. But you did talk to Jeff. I always, I talked to Jeff most days. I mean, you talked to Jeffrey about the incident. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. You know, I yeah. want to repeat what he said. It was yeah. a difficult day for yeah, yeah. everybody. I've had to defend, <laughs> I mean, the rumors yeah. on on you know social media make me crazy and so i end up trolling and getting involved and having to tell people that they're out of their minds and yeah. it didn't happen that way and go read my first book because it's all in there in his words exactly yeah. gary oh, i'm sorry go ahead gary no i didn't it's true i mean jeffrey would tell you what it is ask him a question he would tell you yep yeah I was just going to say, Gary, a few people watching have commented that a couple of records you produced that Jeff played on, uh, Love and Money and, uh, and 10CC Meanwhile. 
that you produced with. So I, I don't know if that rings any bells of anything you. Oh, that love and money. I like that. Yeah. Um, it was great. The three good friends of mine from Scotland who were terrific. We went to Ocean's Way. I uh, came out to L.A. and spent the summer in Malibu, which wasn't so bad. Yeah. And Jeffrey played the record at Ocean's Way. It was a lot of fun. Uh, they, he liked the guys a lot. And it's a terrific record. Terrific. Really yeah. great artist. Do you remember, do you have a recollection, Gary? And again, I, this, I, this goes back a long time, but when he would come in for a session, um, did he generally bring the same drum kit gear wise or did he did he focus if he knew he was doing a record that was you know jr time? would bring his drums to the studio yeah jmo yeah so there was never nobody ever asked about drums or which drum jmo always came with the drums yeah okay but i did do it we did work david and jeffrey came to Woodstock with me and we did an album with an Irish artist named Paul Brady, who's terrific. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I rented beer in Woodstock for him. I'm, I'm pretty, he didn't travel with it. Mm -hmm. And the cup and the times in New York, he didn't travel. I would rent stuff for him. He would either, either he would go to, you know, SIR or Carol, or he had a kid he liked and they would send it over. Yeah. And I, I get the sense that he he knew what he liked, but he probably he could make anything if he if the rental kit if it was an A and R studios and there was a house kit, he could make that work like Gad would do. If all those guys can do that. Yeah. They, you know, I'm sure Jim can do that. They all do that because they run into situations, you know, once in a while that it's not ideal, and something like that'll happen. They all know how to fend. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I have no doubt about that. Yeah. I never saw Jeffrey. I never saw Jeffrey. You know, the state were like, what am I going to do? Never. <laughs> and and he was he was sort of in the early stages of producing records, kind of toward uh, yeah, the end there. Yeah, we I, I don't know much about that part of what he did. You know, making Toto records, they were all producing, I'm sure. Yeah. Jeffrey, yeah, Jeffrey was a distinctive voice in the room, so I'm sure he was doing that with David and the guys. I mean, you know, Luke and used their own records. Yeah. From what I heard, that was sort of his next was would have been his next chapter. He, he did had a problem with his wrist. Yeah, and he did produce one record um, with some buddies of his called the strand uh which is which which is in the new book uh a chapter in the new book um and i, I think that was his thought well he was like i said he was having having problems with his wrist yeah he, he knew it wasn't going to last long mm -hmm. and really he was sort of a producer in the sessions i oh, mean he, when you put a drum yeah. track down he's creating the style of that record and yeah. even larry carlton and and one of the readers <laughs> said to me they they were really um amused by one of the stories because um bill the bounty um said that on a session, he was sort of uh, directing Jeff, and Larry Carlton had to pull him aside and say, you know, even on my sessions, I don't direct him. <laughs> Jeff well, I, is, I, I directed him in the midst of takes. Jeff is, is, Larry said, Jeff is sort of the final word. Yeah. He, he, he if Jeff says something, we sort of defer to Jeff. And that was Larry Carlton telling yeah. Bill. But to be fair, and that's definitely true about Jeffrey, all the great drummers, you could say that about. 
like when Purdy played or Jim played, what they what they played in a given track, they set the tone for that track. That's what the track was going to be, was what they played. Mm -hmm. And we appreciated that. We weren't drummers and we didn't we didn't want to we didn't want to have to do that. We wanted someone like Jeffrey who came in and said, yo, yo, I got it. Yeah. And well, that's that's kind of where I was going. Yeah. With that question, Gary, because I, I like you said, Robin, that was going to be the next. You know, I remember Keltner talking about this too. the next step for Jeff would be yeah. producing because it's it sounds like even like you said, Gary, in all these early sessions, he had he had a vision. He had a producer's mind in terms of and that's you know, that's not just something anybody can do. No, it's a, it, the great musicians. Jeffrey was definitely a great musician, but Jeffrey and Jim and Purdy and Marauder, they heard the record as they were playing. Mm -hmm. They're playing first. Right. It's a great talent. You know, we we we, we required that. We didn't know how to play drums. You know, yeah. Jeff yeah. Walter could talk to Chuck about a bass, and Donald could talk to someone about a keyboard part, but we were stuck when we came to drums. So <laughs> I had the good guys. Hire the good guys. And you did, man. You sure did. It doesn't take much more to hire the good guys than not the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. <laughs> yeah. My, my mother yeah. used to say it's just as easy to marry a rich man as it is a not a rich man. And, and I, 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 except I, with the guys I played with, I went home alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, can I ask you, Gary, in terms of like, you, you, you know, Steely Dan had the greatest engineers, um, absolutely. And um, did was Jeff, did he ever, I mean, the sound that you got out of his drums, was he, did he ever say, geez, I'd love it if you could get, no. I mean, it was like he, and all the guys basically live with the sound. That's, you know, I go through 20 minutes with him of tighten the snare. No, let's not tighten the snare. The, the toms don't sound quite as compatible with what we just got the snare sound. We would do that for 20 minutes and we were done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously you had a great sound in those 20 minutes. It was, yeah. And, you know, I worked with Roger Nichols and Ellie China. Yeah. Yeah. Dream team. Absolutely. Yeah. Who loved each other and made it easy. That's yeah. it. And no, there was no competitive spirit between them. They appreciated what each one did and couldn't wait for them to do what they did to get back to what the other guy did. It was really fun to be around. And one other thing I can say that I don't know anyone can say, for all the years we played, all the musicians and personalities that came in the room, but mainly just the core of us, I never heard an argument. I never heard anything resembling an argument or a loud sentence. Mm. Mm. Ever. Yeah. Mm. Just total respect all the way around. Right? Just, I mean, yeah. Fortunately, it was a group of people who sort of obviously being totally different than each other, but all had that part of their personality. Never heard a loud word in the studio, even when we disagreed. It was yeah. never a that's that's uh, something there's a great question from rob wallace <clears throat> and gary i want to thank you again for being here because i know you moved some things around to be that's here okay. today thank you so much and and uh, i and i do would love to have you in the future um and, and robin too but i would love to just pick your brain about all sorts of other things yeah um, he's gary's so, the best yeah absolutely but here's the question from rob which i think is a great one how did Jeff approach a new song if there was no chart? Would he zero in on vocals or melody or the groove? Donald would sit in the room and he'd play it. So That's he, what he would do. He would, he, Donald would sit at the piano. Yep. Asian, there was a demo, but rarely. Donald would play it. There was Chuck in the room. I'm saying I'm, as often there was Chuck in the room and Paul Griffin and Donald playing, and Jeffrey, and as the guys started to play it, Jeffrey would start playing a groove. 
I know it sounds basic, but that's what we did. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. I, and... play. I didn't want them to ask me what to play. They were yeah. better than we were at that. And that's what made him special is he, he knew the right thing to play instinctively. He just, yeah. Great he... drummers do that. Yeah, yeah. There aren't that many, I mean, there were, I shouldn't say that. There were some really great drummers. The people I worked with were great and were able to do that. And why we worked with them, because we weren't able to fill that in if they didn't. Yeah, yeah. Not that interesting. There, there's, there's lots yeah. of great stories in the book about his, his incredible time and his ability to play a, a pre-recorded track with no click track and overdub drums, which is just, you know, I, I, there are a few counts of that in the book, too. And, I, and did you have an experience with that, Gary? Uh all the time I'm, I'm sorry say that again he didn't love his time he didn't love his time right <laughs> i i know i know now and by the way he wasn't wrong at sometimes sometimes it was okay sometimes we again. and you guys didn't use click tracks oh yes we did you did on but not on everything though pretty on much a, everything. you did yeah, we wanted the guys to, the one thing that Donald, the only thing Donald cared about, only, was a steady drum track. That's why there's a Wendell. And that, <laughs> we couldn't get Hey 19. Yeah. And we were in the room, and Donald turned to Roger and said, can't you build a fucking machine that'll give me a steady drum track? And Roger said, yeah, give me the money and time, and I'll go do it. And he did. <laughs> Yeah, the Wendell. It's the yeah. only thing Donald cared about. You could play a bad note or whatever. Only care about a steady drum track. Uh. So yes, we used click tracks. Yeah. Two times. I can't think of a time we didn't. Really? Okay. And it's funny because... We would always get pushback from Purdy. Well, I'm surprised not Jeff. Steve oh. Picaro. No. Picaro said Jeffrey hated... A click track. Hate it. It's okay. If he hated it, he didn't show it to us and he was just fine. So <laughs> couldn't do it without a click track. Not for what Donald wanted. It was impossible. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, no, every every track was a click track. And Purdy, no matter how many times he would sit, they'd say, you know, I'm the click track. Right. <laughs> he was closer to being right than anybody else much more than anybody else he was a click track but even he we made use a click track was it donald mm. well there there is a there's a story about jeff recording uh bonnie Raitt's luck of the draw the song from that record and uh, i'm sure you know it gary and and uh I think I paul brady wrote that yes yeah of course that's right that's right and uh and you know, the great Ricky Fatara, I guess just it's it's such an amazing song. And I've always loved that song. I, and and uh, I didn't know the backstory. Artist. Do yeah. you know, Gary, know. that that Paul, until he and I spoke, never knew that Jeff ended up on that track? What do you mean? Jeff, yeah. was stuck with us. No. no, no. He didn't. He didn't know that Jeffrey ended up on, on. Oh, luck of the draw. Luck oh. of the draw. Yeah, yeah. He assumed he, it was Ricky. Brett, yeah. Well, record we did, that I love. He, he met. He he worked with Jeff on that album, that you did with him, but he never knew that that was Jeff, yeah. on the Bonnie Ray track until he and I talked. He was stunned. He said, well, I guess he figured out how to work with me on the Woodstock project. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. It was, you know, David and Jeffrey and Landau and and Rainey. It was a good band. And, and Paul, who's a very good guitar player. It was a really good band and a fun record to make. Fun record. Yeah. And I got to meet Bonnie, who I didn't know. And when she came in to sing at the village, she said, well, it was me, Paul, and her husband, who was Michael O'Keefe at the time. 
mm. the actor. Ah. He said, I think you're the only person in the room who hasn't seen me naked. Oh! <laughs> okay. That's how I met Bonnie. I don't know whether I want to know what that means. It was a good introduction, and she sang like Bonnie. And I listened to that track just so I can hear Bonnie, actually. She's mm. just great. Yeah. Do you guys mind if I play a little bit of Luck of the Draw? No. Go. Oh. This, is, this is a beautiful song with Jeff on drums. Title track from the album Luck of the Draw 1991. So this is Jeff in Woodstock with Rainey doing Paul Brady. Pull it, pull it over to the, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. 
So I would say Jeffrey probably recorded that track with her, with her playing. He did it live with her. I could be wrong. I have no idea. But I don't know how you would do that particular track the way she does it. Yeah. And unless he played live with her, because that's not a steady guitar track. No, I know, I know, and that's why when it's when it when I read that the drums were overdubbed, it's superhuman and you know he he certainly had those abilities but yeah that's it's such you know it just it's always sounded to me like they're all in the room together and or he was there with bonnie or 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 mm -hmm. if it was hutch playing bass yeah. um but um it's a just playing a gorgeous guitar. track yeah she's definitely playing guitar so many great songs but i'm going to play something that is kind of to me the the opposite of that last song in terms of just it's it's jeff really kind of just kind of throwing down as they say but um forever man clapton Hello. God, that song. Yeah. 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 Man. Listen, that song. likes that. There's nothing to know except how do you want me to end it? It's just like, it, you know, it's a straight ahead groove. Yeah. But, you know, and, and Gary, I, I, I don't have to tell you this, but he played with such conviction. You know, to me, that song, the first time I heard that in the radio, the summer of 1985, I didn't know it was Jeff until I bought the record and uh, I thought it was Jamie Oldacre who was Clapton's drummer at the time. And, and I love Jamie rest his soul. Um, but man, when I found out it was Jeff, it made perfect sense because it had that, you know, all of a sudden I started hearing familiar things that, you know, from yeah. listening to Jeff and there's just such a conviction. You know, how do you want it to end? Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Right. I wouldn't, wouldn't you uh, say that, 
there's just, there was such a confidence in his playing. There's you know he got up in the morning confident. There was never an issue about that. Yeah, never. No, none of yeah. those guys. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you know Purdy. But a little bit, yeah, yeah. So, confidence. <laughs> more than understand the word confidence. <laughs> All those guys, and the reason is because they know they can do this. Yeah, yeah. You know, they don't have to think anything themselves other than I can do this. Yeah, yeah. They did. Jeffrey was never worried, except if it was a shuffle. But he was never worried about anything to play. And he, I'm sure he didn't do that shuffle shit with other people. He just uh, yeah, that little halftime, you know, and and it's. We hear it a couple of years later. I'll just quickly um, this Toto song. We kind of stop loving you from '88. I don't know why it's not louder. I don't know when Del Del Bit the Blow came out. You remember that track, Poison? Yes. Yeah. No, seriously. That, he would call me every night and say, listen to this, listen to this. And he incorporated that into his psyche as time went by. He loved that he even so did I. It turned out to be sort of like precursor to the pop beats that were cool. Interesting. Um, yeah. He was, in, he was infatuated with that one track. Wow. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just play a couple more little things and um, we can wrap it up. But it, I I want to thank you again, Gary. Is there anything else that comes to mind that you want to share with the folks watching? I wish things came to mind these days. No, they, <laughs> I don't. Whatever you want to know, I'll tell you. But you have to ask me. I appreciate that. No, this this has been incredible having you here and and sharing these stories and um you know i I'll, I'll have you on another time and i'll i'll have more things to pick your brain with i promise but um, it's going rapidly so get there soon <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know maybe maybe we could even do something and, and not to get into it now but um i could get rick Murata and jim keltner to come on and maybe even bernard and we could all of us could pick your brains but your brain. All. Good luck with the mix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Whatever that's another. Sure. Right. That's another story. But uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a few songs before we close out here. And okay. this this is just a a beautiful ballad. <laughs> That's 
His choices, I'll say it again, just he just always knew the exact most beautiful thing to play. Um, and here's an example of Jeff not being able to play a shuffle, as he so he modestly put it. What's cool about the Boz record, even more than more than this, is they knew to fix the drum gear Boz. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Especially yeah. mode. Yes, yep. Just long enough to grab a handle off the top. Next stop, shot down, Leo put the money yep. down. So he added a second hi hat. There were two hi hats. Yeah, yep. He overdubbed the 16th note hi hat yeah. part. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. Baby's in the run around. Wow. Put your business in the crowd. I mean, it's just his, his execution, his precision. Amazing. I'm sorry, Gary. Amazing, considering the fun he used to like to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was just such a natural man. All right, I'm going to close with a... And I'm going to play this last song. I think you'll, you'll recognize this, Gary.
<laughs> oh man. Jeff can play that groove with one hand tied behind his back. Amazing. And he did. Gary, thank you so much for being here. And Robin, thank you so much for being here. I want to one more time mention this great book that is out right now. Definitely. Robin Flan's Moments in Time with The Ford by Gary Katz. Jeff Picaro's story is available on Hudson Music's website. On sale this week, today and all week. And if you haven't picked up Robin's first book from 2020, it's about time. Jeff Picaro, the man in his music. Jeffrey's 70th birthday. On Jeffrey's right. 70th birthday. Oh, today. Yeah. What yeah. would he have done all these years? Wow. Can't even imagine. It's, I, I can't even, I, I can't either really begin to imagine what the last 30 years, the amount of music he would have, great music he would have made and, and probably produced. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th I really thank you um, for having me and Gary, thank you for coming in. Fun. Here. <laughs> yeah, this was fun. And uh, anytime you want to do something, just, you know, let me know. I will. I absolutely will, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to end the stream. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. A big hand for my guests, Robin Flans, the legendary Gary Katz, and um, happy birthday to our hero, Jeff Picaro. We love and miss him every happy day. Happy birthday to my good friend, Jeff. And our good friend, Harvey, whose birthday we all shared a year together. Oh. Happy man. birthday. All right. Two April Fool friends among. Huh. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Jeff. Thanks again. Uh, Fun. Let me know if you want to do something. I'm around. I will. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye, guys. Um, all right, well, that's my show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, leave me a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. And the podcast is available on all the podcast platforms, so download it. And remember, no drummers are ever harmed on Live From My Drum Room or Track Talk. And drummers, when in doubt, leave it out. All right, again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again real soon. See ya.